Hello Winchester. Welcome to WinCam. The views and opinions on Visual Radio Live are those of the host and his guests John Byers and David Meyer tonight and not necessarily those of Winchester Community Access and Media. Its members, staff, board of directors, people of Winchester, in all planes of the known universe. Hello, we've got David Meyer tonight. He wrote this biography of the Bee Gees. It's amazing. Used to be on WMBR Radio. He's in Florida these days. We're going to talk to him in about five minutes. Right now, we're going to talk to John Byers. Just for a couple of minutes. <phone rings> Bruins are on tonight. Bruins are on tonight. And if Johnny's not there, we'll talk to David. Um, I got this Frankenstein graphic novel, novel today. Uh, it's a comic book of Frankenstein. Uh, adapted by Carrie Reed and illustrated by Fraser Irving. Your call. Well, Johnny's not around, so he'll call back in a second, and if not, we'll go right to David Meyer. The 60s by Jenny Diskey. Now, this is Big Ideas, Small Books. This is a really small book. Um, Jenny Diskey looks amazingly like a pop art friend of mine who's in a rock band. Um, she's now in Cambridge. Welcome to Wing Cam. Hey, Joe. How are you? Good, John. Are you watching the Bruins? Uh, no, but I can get you a score right away. Hold on. Let me just switch to nothing. Yeah, because they started at 7 tonight. And uh, our director, Jeff Dearman, is over at the TD Bank North Garden, if they're in town. They're in a commercial right now, but with my sports app that's built into my TV, I can get a score right away by just pressing a simple button. We're only going to talk a couple of minutes. Did you hear who passed away? No. Uh, Mrs. Jack McGlynn at 92 years old. Wow. So that... Uh, it is one-to-one -one at the end of one period of play. Okay, so our condolences out to the McGlynn family in Medford, the mayor of Medford's mother. Wife of the former mayor, Jack McGlynn. She has a very extended family. Uh, she had caregivers, and they were actually noted in the obit being thanked which is very touching she she looked like a very sharp lady she worked with foster furcolo wow she went way back and, and and she worked with the kennedys she worked with the kennedys so she was the grand lady of medford politics yeah so mrs bloomberg is gone now and mrs mcglynn is gone now our good thoughts and good vibes out to them passed away huh when did mrs bloomberg pass away about a year and a half two years ago okay so the two grand ladies of Medford, uh, Mrs. Bloomberg and Mrs. McGlynn, um, and we send our condolences to the McGlynn family, the extended family, and it's notated in InsideMedford.com, where you can read about it on Medford.Patch.com. Both have the uh, news. It strangely was not in the transcript yet. Yeah. But I wanted to alert you to that. We're talking to David Meyer tonight, Johnny, about the Bee Gees. Yep. So when you, wait, I just want to call you first. I got this thing in the mail, re-elect Fred DeLaRusso Jr. Wow. Did you get one of them? I got one of them, yeah, but it's no good now. I mean, we already had our election. Did you vote for him? Of course I did. You've campaigned for him. Actually, uh, the DeLaRusso, 357 Main Street, is where the wake for Mrs. McGlynn will be on Saturday and Sunday. So how appropriate is that, that... Uh, yeah. The uh, committee to elect Fred De La Russo Jr. is also where they're going to wake the mayor's, yeah. the matriarch of Medford. Uh, now, I don't know, are you on live tonight, Joe? Yes, we are on live. Because I have uh, one cam on my, on my computer right now, and I'm getting a, like a commercial advertisement of some sort. It kicks in later. It takes it a couple of minutes to kick in. Could you keep watching for us? Yes. And uh, call me on the cell phone if you can, yeah. if, if it continues, because it should be on right now. Yeah, well, and I'll tell you, now we are coming up actually tomorrow is an anniversary of sorts uh, with the John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And they've been, uh, they've been uh, airing all these things regarding uh, the assassination. And one of the interesting things that I saw on this uh, was, believe it or not, 
John Kennedy, now, now this may sound strange, but John Kennedy would probably still be alive today if it wasn't for his back problems. Well, I know, John, but we don't have time to talk about it. Yep. Are we on the computer yet? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Um, I'll, bring you, I'll bring you a couple of times when I see you. All right, thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks. And we were going to talk John Kennedy tonight, but we're going to talk to David Mayer. And uh, Judy, uh, John says that we're not on the computer. So, but I think we're going out live here on WinCam. So let's call our guest. Hey, David, how are you? Good. Welcome to Visual Radio Live. You are live. Thank you. Hi. Good to be here. So, um, the pronunciation of your last name, is it like Russ Meyer? Yeah, it's Meyer. And last week we had Archer Mayer, the uh, best-selling uh, mystery author of the Jug Gunther series. Oh, cool. Archer Mayer to David Meyer. Hello, David. Uh, <laughs> so, you were on WMBR back in the day. Yes, way, way back in the day, I had a, a short live uh, morning show. Was it part of the Late Risers Club? Yes, it was. It was part of the Late Risers Club. Wow. What a memory. Yeah. And um, my friend Zachary Tooman and I did it. And we had a rule that the first half hour of the show had to have Beach Boy song, an Otis Redding song, uh, and a Doug Somm song. And our, our proudest moment was we got a call at like 7.20 in the morning from uh, Peter Wolf. They had been rehearsing all night. Somehow stumbled onto the show and liked what we were. So that, that was high praise. And that, that's very cool. Yeah. Because, of course, he was a great DJ himself. Absolutely. And I'm sure he's been on MBR, which was TBS back then, right? I don't know. When, when, when I was on, it was NBR. Okay, so Turner Broadcasting bought the call letters from them. Oh, they did? Yeah, it used to be WTBS. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. I'll give you a little history, because visual radio, this has got to be uh, like our 900th or 1,000th show. I've stopped counting. Once I started doing it weekly, it was really hard to keep the numbers, you know? Right. Uh, but we had little Walter DeVen on, the DJ. Oh. Little Walter's Time Machine. So he was on TBS when MBR was TBS. And he went to Revere and he taped his friend Little Richard. And he broadcast it the next day on TBS, not thinking anything. And then when I interviewed him, which had to be like 1996, I'd say. Walter and I are good friends now, but uh, we just known each other uh, casually. And, and so he was on the show. He had taped Jimi Hendrix with Little Richard and broadcast it on TBS. The only known tape of Little Richard live with Jimi Hendrix. Wow, that's amazing. So TBS actually broadcast it the next day. Who knew, right? Yeah. So I put the Jimi Hendrix estate together with Little Walter, and Little Richard does not want it out yet. But at some point, I would think the Hendrix estate will put out the Little Walter Jimi Hendrix tape. Be nice to hear, wouldn't it? I've heard it. I was sitting there, and we listened to the TBS, the MBR version. So he had two tapes, the original, and then he had what he broadcast on the air, and he played us that. And I saw her standing there as the first number. Wow. It's a little trivia for you. Yeah, no, it's great. So uh, on your show on Late Rises Club, and did you have a name for the show? Um, yes, we call it Sleepwalk after the, um, I think it was the XTC song. Okay. Call it either called a sleepwalk or the rubber mallet, one or the other, like interchangeably. Did you play any Odessa on that? We, to my knowledge, we never played a Bee Gees song, even though we were attempting to revive 70s music at that time. We are a little ahead of ourselves, a little ahead of the curve. And, um, but I don't think we ever played a Bee Gees song. Interesting. Now, you have a book out, The Bee Gees Biography. They're an interesting band when it comes to greatest hits because they have a number of great greatest hits albums and box sets. Yeah, and they're an interesting band, period, I think. Uh, absolutely. 
uh, the Australian thing, first and foremost, I'd say. Well, you know, for me, first and foremost, what's so interesting is that, you know, everybody knows that after a certain amount of time, no one in a band can stand anybody else in a band. Right. And nobody can really stand to be around their families all the time, no matter how much they love them. And yet these guys worked together for 40 years. How in the world did they do it? What kind of tensions arose? What, what did they have to put up with in order to do that? It's, it's a great story. Any fights over Lulu? No. Horace <laughs> <laughs> says, welcome to Lulu. As near as I can tell, they very seldom... I have discovered no fights over women within the band, among the brothers. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Um... We'll get into some of the details soon, but I had a couple of fun things to uh, bring up. Like for the, this, um, tragically, when, when we lost one of the brothers, there was a big thing on radio up here. How do you pronounce his name? I have always said Maurice Gibb. Morris. Morris Gibb. Like Morris the cat, spelled like Maurice, pronounced like Morris. But those of us who were entrenched with Maurice don't want to change to Morris after he died and, and it got out that it was Morris. Listen, I never knew it was Morris until I started writing the book, but now I am in the Morris camp. Firm. Really? Okay. Morris Gibb. I mean, it just reminds me of Morris Levy. You know, I mean, there's only one Morris in rock and roll, Morris Levy. I mean, it's, for me, it's much easier to think of him as Morris than Maurice, because Maurice is just such a, a twee name that it's very hard to associate it with this Australian rock and roll. <coughs> You want to call him a rock and roller. You want to think Maurice Chevalier. Yeah. <laughs> he was a down-home guy, so Morris suits him. Okay. Um, did you meet any of the Bee Gees? No. Um, had already passed when I started writing the book. Robin was in Scotland, in England, and Barry would not talk to me and did his best to keep everyone else from talking to me as well. Interesting. Yeah, he tweeted that he didn't want any of his fans buying the book, and I, I tried to interview a number of people who all said to me, if I talk to you, Barry will never speak to me again. Barry has expressly forbade me from talking to you. Now that blows me away. Yeah, imagine how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like you're Albert Goldman. You know. Barry is a very controlling guy. And the Bee Gees have always sought to control their story. It's one of their greatest um, PR blunders is how they attempted to control things that couldn't be controlled. Yeah, because people need to read and journalists want to write. So well, Everybody wants to know the story of the Bee Gees, and I bear them and bore them no ill will. I just wanted to write about things that really happened. And nobody's written as seriously about their music as I have, but Barry... And the Bee Gees super fans are very opposed to the book, even though they've never read it. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, there's certain aspects for people in behind the scenes, like Albie Galut and Carl Richardson. What a great team. Yes, yeah, um, un unbelievable and never, oddly, very seldom mentioned in the annals of really great and groundbreaking producers, but they were, and they made records that had sounds that had never had come before and as I say in the book they invented the drum loop Albie and Carl invented the drum loop the first drum loop ever appears on Stand Alive and, and how do in what respect well no one had ever before pre-recorded uh, one beat or multiple beats of a drum and used it played over and over to provide the beat for the entire song and it's called a drum loop because they made this 25-foot loop of tape and ran it all over the studio. And that 25-foot piece of tape encompassed one uh, drum beat that they had recorded for um, an earlier song. And their drummers had someone in the family who was ill and left France for their recording and went to England. They wanted to cut the track. They made this drum loop, and it's the drum sound on Stand Alive. There was, you know the song, Na Na Hey Hey, Kiss Him Goodbye? Yes. Good friend of mine, Gary DiCarlo of Steam, he's the lead singer. Uh, he and Paul Lecca had written, well, they had recorded uh, Neil Sedaka's 
Sugar Sugar, not the Archie's tune, but a Neil Sedaka tune. And they had looped a drum, which became Na Na Hey Hey Kiss Him Goodbye. But I guess maybe it wasn't 25 feet long. And, you know, that was 1969. But that was a loop. Right, well, I'll have to look into that because I have not found any convincing story of someone setting out to pre record a drum sound and then recording it to take a recorded drum sound and record it back again as the main drum track of a song. So I'd like to find that out and see. I can hook you up with Gary. It, um you know, Nana Hey Hey was the flip of a 45. It wasn't meant to be the A side. That's interesting. And uh, they had recorded it. It's now this big stadium hit. And a colleague of mine is writing the book on it because uh, it's such a monster stadium hit. So we've, you know, we've interviewed Gary about five hours now. Uh, but it's a fascinating story. But of course, what you're talking about with Staying Alive is this massive tape loop in the studio, right? Just this big. Uh, made, a, made a loop of a drum sound. Two inch tape, um, 30 IPS, it must have been enormous. Yeah, I think it was, I think, I wonder if it was two inch, I wonder if it wasn't one inch, but I don't know. No, I think they were using two inch because they recorded 90, uh, 96 tracks, correct? They were tracking 96 tracks down there in Florida. Isn't that the studio that Eric Clapton's on the front of the, uh, yeah, but they cut this in France, and I believe they cut <coughs> basic tracks on 20. I don't think that... Um, oh, they cut it in France. Yeah, I don't think Staying Alive, I don't think that album is a 96-track album. I think it's a 24-track album. Interesting. Whoa, now that is really... Uh, because you'd always hear about, uh, you know, like tragedy, that they were using these 96 tracks. Yeah, well, tragedy is a good deal later. And, yes, I, I understand that. Um... But I thought that during the disco era, they were really using these um, enormous amounts of tracks. Yeah, but that came, remember, that came after, because, um, you know, nobody expected Saturday Night Fever to do what it did. Right. And they had gone to France to um, the Chateau Aeroville, the, the honky chateau, where Elton John made it famous by recording there and naming his record after it. And they didn't know they were making... Um, a movie soundtrack. They were trying to find tracks for their, their next record, and then Stigwood showed up with a script for Saturday Night Live, which none of them read. And Robert Stigwood told them about the story and asked them to modify some of their songs accordingly. So they cut all the basic tracks in France and then added some vocals in at um, a Criterion in Miami and added some percussion in, uh, in L.A. But the bulk of the songs were cut in France. Did you ever meet Stiggy? Good old Stiggy. Well, you know, Stiggy's gone into a certain kind of exile. You know, he's in his castle. He don't come out of his castle. You know, by the time I started this book, everything I could learn suggested he was not 100%. And he didn't, you know, Stiggy didn't have no truck with nobody. Now, I'll tell you a funny story, just as an aside. I, I used to manage the late Jimmy Miller. We were business partners. Right. He produced the Rolling Stones? Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, so we were at 1776 Broadway. That's where our office was because Burt Padell has a whole fleet of offices. Alice Cooper was there and uh, oh, Paul Butterfield's manager. and So you had all these managers up there, you know, and, and we had the Jimmy Miller Music Office, which was cool because it was 1776 Broadway's and the Rolling Stones were like 1778. And Stigwood was a, <coughs> a few floors up from us. We never saw Stiggy. Uh, Jimmy Miller knew him, of course, but we never saw him in all our years of uh, hanging out in New York and going to A&R, but we knew his A&R man. And we used to hang out with him and, and go to nightclubs and whatever. So Stigwood's office was amazing. You know, mahogany and just beautiful. But never saw the Invisible Man. You know, I think that people don't stop to think just how much money Stigwood made. Oh, yeah. You know, the... the the BG sued him at some point, but say they only sold 225 million of their 250 million records while he was still their manager. You know, when he came back from signing their first deal, you know, his partners with Brian Epstein, he came back from signing their first deal and told Epstein that he had gotten 50% of their songwriting to perpetuity for a thousand pounds. 
And Epstein just went berserk. Epstein thought it was the worst deal the guy had ever made. So un until they sued him and, and took back their songwriting, he had 50% of their songwriting through, through all their biggest years. You know, the three of them were cutting up whatever was left after taxes on 50%, but Stigwood had 50% of it. And he had uh, the bulk of Saturday Night Fever's gross in America to make $275 million domestically, and he had something like 50% plus of that. Oh. He made a very great deal of money indeed. He had this huge yacht, because I saw the picture in his office, just this monstrous yacht. Uh, when you get that kind of money, though, it's just, uh, you know. Well, you know, they say that Morris, Morris Gibb, spent $100 million on cars. You know, this is not when a collector car would sell for 6 or $7 million, you know. So that's a lot of cars, $100 million worth of cars in his era. And at one point you think, you know, isn't it a, getting a little ridiculous? Well, I think they ran out of things to spend money on, and they had so much of it. Uh, there's people starving in Biafra, but... Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, there's good things you can do with your good fortune. Uh, and there are people that do the gate. Bill Gates has his foundation, and but a hundred million in cars. Jay Leno must be envious. A <laughs> hundred million in cars. They had a lot of dough. You know, Andy was the first person ever to have his first three songs go to number one. Oh. They were all written by Barry, but still. So, you know, Andy was an earning machine from day one. Now, one question I have for you is, uh, there were some magnificent songs for other people. Yvonne Elliman, you know, Tavares covered More Than a Woman. Right. But you had the uh, beautiful Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton hit, Islands in the Stream. Right. Uh, Barbara Streisand's magnificent Woman in Love. And Guilty, don't forget Guilty, which is a great song. Yes, it is. So but, she took to number one. But I just have a fond spot for Woman in Love, Woman in Love. I just thought it was so extraordinary, it even overshadowed Guilty. Right. Um, Dionne Warwick, Heartbreaker. Dionne might not have liked it, but it helped her out immensely. Number one? You could make a, an album of the songs the Bee Gees recorded for other people, and on the flip side have the Bee Gees versions, which some of them showed up on um, that beautiful white and blue greatest hits, the triple record set. Anthology? Uh, the, the, there was a triple record anthology uh, vinyl back in the 80s. Uh, I forget the name of it, but I have it. I really argue strenuously in the book that I think Barry is one of the four or five greatest uh, pop songwriters in the second half of the century, and that he went out and wrote and produced all these purpose-built number ones for other people that so fit their style. Now, let's not forget that Barry wrote To Love Somebody for Otis Redding. Did not know it. I say in the, in the book it would be the greatest Otis Redding song that Otis Redding ever recorded. And... That, that's just the beginning. I think it took such, um, such an ear, such understanding to recognize how perfect to love somebody is for, for Otis, and then to come in and write Guilty and write the song for, you know, and write the song for, for um, Kenny Rogers. He, he really understood these other artists, and he was a genius a producer, and he's got, the, he's got the sales to prove it. To love somebody is, is, is almost like the zenith because you, you just can't write a better song. Well, that's what I say in the book is that, you know, if the only song the guy ever wrote was to love somebody, he'd be an immortal. Everyone's covered it. Kathy McDonald, who worked a little with Big Brother and the Holding Company, she just passed away. She did To, to Love Somebody. Um, great blues artist that she was. Obscure, but it was, and, and that's when it's really uh, hip. When, when a great blues artist that, that isn't a household name covers your song, uh, and it's not, you know, a, pop, a disposable pop song, it's an important work of art. Yeah, it's easier to find people that haven't covered it than people that have. You got it. Everybody. I love Eric Burden's version. You know, it's really insane, and I like it a lot. And I, I love Grant Parsons' version. Now, Eric Burden's, was that with the War album? No, this is one of the last Animals records. Okay. Credited to the Animals. It gets blurry for me. 
Yeah, uh, for good reason. But I'm a big fan. Um, yeah, but I didn't do drugs. Things just get blurry. There's too much information up there. Yeah, well, that, that's what I presumed you meant. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but it's fun even talking about it. it it's fun. Just... No, they just don't get the credit that's due. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't put out a lot of tripe. You know, they are... The Bee Gees are, to say the obvious aloud, they are not an album band, you know, and their albums had, were two great songs, two decent songs, and a bunch of garbage. I'm not sure they could so much tell their A-plus work from their B. I don't, I don't know if they could. But it's kind of like Rock Hudson, who I guess he had like the worst screen test of all time, and they would use the screen test to show how great an actor could become with, you know, the first false steps. Uh, the Bee Gees learned their craft and later made these magnificent recordings that no one could touch. They were in a world unto themselves. Yeah, I think if you hunt down Robin's solo record, Sing Slowly Sisters, there's a song in there, Avalanche, that I think might really surprise you. Very stripped down production, very naked emotion in a way that we don't associate with the Bee Gees. You know, they don't usually sing about their own feelings that much. And this is just a, a really, really moving song that really changed my view of Robin. Now, I've got the Robin Gibbs solo albums. I've played them into the ground, and I can't, I can't remember them. That's, that's how much music has gone through, but I have played them quite a bit. Um, Boys, there was a song he had called Boys, what was that? It was a single. I don't know. Boys. Like you say, there's so many of them. He had a great single, um, and then he had one, uh, Jeanette or something, on that Polydor album. Oh, great song. Two great um, timeless songs that need to be rediscovered. Well, you know, Robin is, is really an interesting figure because you can hear... Juliet, look, Juliet, sorry. Up until the time that Barry quit letting him sing lead, um, you could really hear that Robin was vested in a different era. You know, he was vested in the era of Gene Pitney and, and Scott Walker, these singers that are essentially... They have a hysterical aspect, and even if their lyrics aren't profoundly emotional... Their delivery is just all this emotion turned up to 11. And then he sort of never moved out of that era. You know, and when you, when you hear his vocals, you really hear, you know, you hear 50s doo-wop and you hear these really over-the-top guys. And he never modernized that sound. That's the sound he always liked. Whereas Barry was always pushing the band to stay abreast of what was going on. Now, I didn't realize Barry kind of pushed him. Was it uh, kind of like Diana Ross thing with the other girls, pushed them aside? And... Well, it, was just, it was that um, Barry did not want Robin to sing lead anymore. Barry wanted to run the band himself, as he always had. You know, when he was, when he was 17 and they were 13, he told them what to do. But when he was 24 and they were 20, they weren't so into it. They wanted to be equals in this band, but Barry did not want to give up control, and Stigwood was on Barry's side, and Barry and Stigwood felt that Robin's leads were not sufficiently commercial. And this is what led the band to break up in late 1970, was that um, Barry's single was 1st of May, right? Yep. And, and Robin had a single upcoming on the same record, and he thought his single should be the first single released, even though objectively it's nowhere near as commercial. And when Stigwood and Barry went for 1st of May, Robin quit the band. Huh. And then they were like, all of them were like two years in the wilderness and they couldn't write anything they liked, they couldn't sell anything, they couldn't get arrested. They came back together, but they came back together under very clear terms, which were that Barry would determine who sang lead on what. And from then on, Barry would sing lead even on songs that Robin wrote. Hmm. And Robin made those two solo records during their breakup. So was Lonely Days, Lonely Nights, The Reunion? Yes, exactly. And, and that's, of course, a song celebrating their getting back together. Great song. Yeah, it's, one of my, it's one of my two or three favorite songs of theirs. Yeah, and it's hard to say that you have two or three favorites. There's so many great ones. But I, I really like it. It has a joyous that you don't... You know, they're not a joyous band but that is a really happy, um, ecstatic song, which you just don't think of as their sound. 
And what do you call Dolly Parton doing the backstroke? Okay, what do you? Islands in the stream. <laughs> it's the bad joke of the night, sorry. It just ruined everything. We had a good interview going. I couldn't resist. You never heard that one. No, I know that Penny Rogers tells the story that he could not get together. He could just, he couldn't really perform it. Um, they didn't know what to do. And his manager told him that Dolly was in the building. And he said, well, go get Dolly. Maybe she can save this. And she came in and sang it right on the spur of the moment. Wow. And the Bee Gees say that Kenny was not together at all, that he didn't learn his lines, he didn't come in to rehearse, that they feel they had to drag him kicking and screaming through every song on that record. Well, you know, success, and Kenny should know better, because I've read his book, Making It With Music. Yeah. A really great book. You can get it like, you know, you can find a used copy somewhere cheap because people ignore it, but he had written this really great book about making it in the music industry, making it in music with Kenny Rogers. Right. And uh, he tells the tough time between, you know, the first edition and Lucille and the, the you know, the tough time he had, as so many have had. Uh, music industry being a fickle c creature. Um, so Kenny should really, uh, knowing that it can just be taken from you in a heartbeat, one would think he would have uh, really relished the chance to work with these um, pop geniuses. But, but they say he did not. And, and, and he says himself that, that uh, Dolly saved it. I think it's very interesting. Now, did you talk to Kenny or Dolly for the book? No, no, they would not talk to me. Amazing. They really put out the word. Dionne Warwick? None of, nobody on that level would talk to me. Samantha. Samantha sang, right? Emo well, she, she had emotion, right? Yes, she had emotion. That's funny. Yes. That would, that would be, uh, let me turn this down. So that would be her. Now, uh, can I, and you don't have to answer. I mean, I'm just having fun. And, you know, I hope you're enjoying yourself. I am. Um, who did you talk to? Uh, can I ask? Well, I talked to a number of people, but almost all of them um, wanted privacy. Okay. So, um, um, I had one very brief interview with Alby that was uh, really illuminating. And then, let's see, what else did I talk to? I talked to some people down here at Criterion, and I talked to people who had played with them, and I talked to people who knew them. I talked to people that knew Andy, but, you know, 99% of them took a great deal of persuading and did not want to be revealed. That, it, it totally amazes me. Yeah, it amazed me too, believe me. Because, you know, for my Graham Parsons book, me and my research assistants interviewed, you know, upwards of 250 people. And a lot of these people wanted anonymity or wanted to be disguised in the book. And no one ever complained, ever, about a breach of confidence. Or, but, and also people wanted the story to get out, but... Barry did not want to be talked about, period. And I'm sure he'll do his own book soon enough. Yeah, which is, you know, but, but soon enough. I mean, the, the book should have come out 15, 20 years ago for him. Well, you know, he's done some interviews recently. He's been, you know, he's been playing some shows. And for the first time in his life, has actually talked about his own emotions, especially his emotions about his brothers and their deaths and, being estranged from them when he when they died, and it, it's a new Barry that he wants to reveal what he feels and thinks, which he has never wanted to before ever. And so I don't think he could have written this book 15 years ago. But boy, when he when it comes out, I think it's going to sell a ton. Now I'm I'm thrilled you talked to Alby. Uh, what are they doing? Are, are they a they? Is it Albie and Kyle separate now? No, for some time. I'm going to get his title slightly wrong. But Albie is, he is a futurist at Sony now. And uh, does a lot with intellectual property at Sony. And he is a, um, he's one of the big brains at Sony. Uh, dealing with all sorts of, of futurist issues over, um, 
ownership and rights and new technologies coming and so he hasn't produced in some time he he is involved in the in the in the world of computers in the world of internet and all the new way all the new delivery systems of music as well albi is a very smart man you'd have to be and carl richardson uh carl as i understand it is still producing has his own studio down here ah yeah but the heyday was with the bg certainly yes they they did um, and well and uh, you know carl and albi were involved in a lot of these other projects you know in the di in the Dion Warwick in the uh, um, Kenny Rogers in the uh, Samantha Sang. I don't know about that, but um, so they were they were involved a lot of these on the um, on the Diana Ross album. They are had co-producing credits and they had co-songwriting credits as well. I forgot the Diana Ross. Yeah, so oh. they were they were involved they were involved in that one too, and then Barry got a number. Wrote a number one for Diana on that record too. Which was happily, having finished the book, I have forgotten almost every detail about the Bee Gees. I think that's a, a, a superb oh. record. I forget the name of it. It's it's incredible. I love Diana Ross. Yeah, it's a very very good record, and you can hear on it that Diana Ross and the label wanted a thriller sound, and Michael Jackson sings on that song. And I'm not sure that Barry would have given it quite as thrillery um, a sound as it ended up having left to his own devices. But he gave the client what the client wanted, and he got her a number one. And, you know, when he was brought in for Kenny, for Banner Ross and for Dionne Warwick, he was brought in because their record label regarded them as albatrosses. Hmm. And they were, they were the laughing stock in L.A. for having signed these two, and nobody thought they could monetize them at all. And so Barry was brought in just to increase the pressure as a miracle worker. And he worked miracles. But Dion had the success with Barry Manilow. Yeah. And I, Isaac Hayes. Yeah. And um, I, I thought Clive Davis was very smart signing her, um, myself. Right, but at the time people thought it was more um, a gesture of goodwill on his part than sound business. Ah. And, and Barry demonstrated that it was sound business. Well, was it 1987? Arista Records, um, some ridiculous amount of their records, over 80% went gold and platinum. Yeah, they really had it. Carly Simon uh, coming around again, and Clive just really had the magic touch. But KBC band, Marty Ballin, Paul Kantner, and uh, you know Jack Cassidy of the Airplane fizzled. Uh, he really needed, Clive really needed to get a Barry Gibb involved with them, with Marty's great voice. Yeah. That was a big mistake. Well, they had, you know, eh. You can only do so much, I guess. Right. Um, fascinating story. So, the book came out in August? Yes. And the book, the, the title is The Bee Gees. It's the title is Bee Gees, The Biography. Because no one ever did one. No, there's a, there's a, kind of a fan-written book called Tales of the Brothers Gibb, but it, um, there are no attributions. It's, it's hard to tell which stories are real and which are not. It's quite, quite lengthy. You know, it's written by fans. This is the first serious biography of the Bee Gees. All right, well, we thank you and for doing I read doing a lot that. about the music also. And, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, there were these quickie books that, like, 16 Magazine might pump out. Yeah. I have one on Alice Cooper, so there was probably one on the Bee Gees, but it would well, the be... The Bee Gees self-published a fan book uh, written by David Leith um, in 1979 that's very much like one of those books, Little Pocket. Yeah. Um, you can find it on Amazon for a dollar. Now, the funny thing is, the Alice Cooper book is actually very good. So the guy must have written it in three days, you know, churned it out, but it's actually not a bad one. Well, For there the... was so much great rock and roll writing then, you know, Lester Bangs and... Uh, Paul Stewart, I think, wrote an amazing one about Rod Stewart, and Lester Bangs wrote a great one about Blondie. I met Lester when he, uh, I bought a copy for my, the singer in my band, 
And uh, he was at New England, New England Music City in Harvard Square. Wow. And uh, told him who I was and asked him to sign it to Carolyn. And he goes, we know who you are. And that was just so cool to me, you know, that he knew who I was. Right. So that was kind of uh, my Lester Bangs moment. God rest his soul. God rest his soul indeed. My book is dedicated to him. Is it? Yep. Both my rock and roll books are dedicated to Lester. He was in a band, too. I have a couple of the records. Yeah, I used to have the, the singles. The Delinquents? I, I just had a different name. Um, yeah. Let It Blurt. Let It Blurt. Let it, <sighs> I, had a I like that. Blurt. Yeah. Now, I like talking about you, not talking about me, but I'll talk about me for one second. Okay. I'm involved in a book on Lou Reed with yeah. Dinky Dawson, Lou's engineer. Yeah. And Alan Bershaw from Wolf Sing Wolfgang's Vault. Yeah. He writes all the... Uh, so the three of us are doing a book on Lou Reed's 1973 tour. Why I'm even bringing it up is that Mitch Ryder in Detroit had uh, Bob Ezrin producing and Steve Hunter in the band. They would practice at Cream Magazine. They practiced in the Cream Magazine building. Oh, that's great. I guess the publisher of Cream was managing Mitch Ryder. That makes sense. But Lou heard the record. They did rock and roll, a great version. And uh, Steve Hunter was on the show just a couple of months ago, and uh, they did a great version. So Lou Reed called up Ezrin, and they did the Berlin album, and the rest is history. But it's just kind of interesting. Lester Bangs, Cream Magazine, there was a whole thing back then that doesn't exist now. No, Cream was the, the, just the best magazine that ever was. Have you friended the cream, uh, Boy Howdy, on Facebook? Say that again? Boy Howdy's on Facebook, if you look for Yeah, well, you know, I'm a, yes, I'm a member. Oh, good, I am too. Yeah. We got that in common. Yeah. Uh, uh, Robot Hull, do you remember him, the writer? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm friends with him on Facebook. We correspond pretty regularly. He, he, he's one of my favorite writers back then. Yeah, me too. Uh, so, yeah, he's on my site. Yeah. So That's pretty funny. That's great, David. Yeah. yeah you're no relation to Russ Meyer, are you? Russ, he was Russ Myers. Oh, okay. -E oh, a plural. I didn't. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have an autograph of his, but I never met him. A friend of mine bought those um, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Right. And you know, and, and it came with a Russ Meyer autograph. The the VHS is kind of cool. He owned a video store. Myers. Um, so, how long were you in the Boston area? Oh, I was just, I lived there for like a, a little less than a year. Oh, okay. Where are you from? I'm from a small town in North Georgia. Okay. That no one has ever heard of. And did you go to college down there? Or? Yeah, I actually finished school at Temple in Philadelphia. Okay. When, when it was an amazing jazz town, I just saw one incredible jazz show after another. And what prompted you to write the Graham Parsons book? And when did that come out? Graham Parsons' book came out in 2008, and it's because Graham Parsons' music means so much to me. I always say he has the most moving white voice I've ever heard, and it's not really white voices that move me. And uh, I love his songwriting. I love his singing. He's a tragic story. He's a really fascinating story. So, and, and I feel like his story had never been properly told, and I very much wanted to write about him. The, the only connection I see between Graham Parsons and the Bee Gees is that they're underwritten. Uh, no one, and, and, and I don't mean underwriting either, I mean no one's really written about them the way you have, so that's the only connection. I, when you say to someone, the Bee Gees... Somebody. That's the only thing that connects them. Huh? And to love somebody. Ah. Since, you know, Graham covered it. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think they connect particularly. You know, Graham, the essence of Graham was his soulfulness and his desire to express his true self and the difficulties he had doing that and the, the, the Bee Gees never seemed particularly driven to express themselves themselves to to show themselves to the world they saw themselves as entertainers not as um, personal expression artists in the way that Graham saw himself now uh, did Australia embrace the Bee Gees I would assume so well they say that they have embraced the Bee Gees since they were successful, and Barry did a little tour down there, and they just went crazy for him. But the, the Bee Gees always felt, when they left Australia for England, 
um, that they had struggled and struggled and struggled in Australia and never gotten what they deserved. And their first number one in Australia occurred right when they first got to England, when they had finally realized that Australia wasn't going to happen for them and went to England. So they were, they were somewhat bitter about Australia for a while. Was that Spicks and Specks? Yeah, Spicks and Specks, which I think is a great pop song. I think it really stands up. Yet people in America don't know it. Nobody knows it. I mean, even though it, it did it decently in England, um, 1941 mining disaster so wiped it out of everybody's consciousness. I never heard of it until I started writing the book, and I think it's a terrific song. Are you surprised that I knew the name? Uh, not at all. Okay, good. <laughs> I like the band. I like them. Yeah, me too. Especially, especially the pre-disco. I, I mean, I appreciate. I appreciate what they did with disco, but it was, um, I think my favorite album of that era is the red one there. Um, with Death. Uh, no, 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 no. Spirits having flown. Oh yeah, Spirits having flown. It's a great record. I mean, I'm a Odessa Ona because I love the Velvet, right? Right. But I'm a, a Spirits having flown. Uh, I just think the title track is amazing. Yeah, the title track is amazing. And Tragedy is an amazing single. Yeah, it's a great song. With the explosion, whatever they did with the cupping their mouths or whatever, but like, yeah. boom, Tragedy. Great, 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 great pop songs. Tracks on Tragedy. Huh? Millions of tracks on Tragedy. Well, you know, about that 90s, you know, I make records. I don't know if you know that. Um, okay. But uh, 96 tracks, I guess you have to harness the 24 track machines with four tracks. So if you're doing 96, you're going to take away four machines times four. That's 16 tracks you're not using because they're harnessing the sound through four tracks on each machine. Right. From what I understand. So then you would have basically 80 tracks, not 96, but you can bounce down and then, you know, before the digital world came in. However you slice it, it's a lot of tracks. And that's a lot of tape because yeah. a two-inch tape would cost, you know, uh, 200 bucks or whatever, uh, you got 15 minutes of tape on it yeah. to do these albums with, you know, you got to buy four of these and sync them up and someone's got to keep track of what's on where. Yeah. My God, that, that is tough work. It's tough work. Computers now, it's a lot more easy. It's so much easier. Yeah. Um, I mean, Albie said something that I quoted in the book. I, I won't get his quote exactly right. He said, you know, the, he said that the further you get from the singer, but it could have been the guitar or the drum. He meant the source itself. He said the more things that come between you and the singer, he thinks the less interesting the record. And so he, he felt that the technical restrictions granted a kind of authenticity that he, he I mean, he makes his living as a futurist, so he, he, he doesn't think things are worse now. But he thinks it's a greater struggle to maintain the, an authentic sound from anyone today. Well, I think they're taking a lot of the music being made today, and it might be made accurately, but they're making them for earbuds and these horrible speakers at the uh, restaurants everywhere, just the worst speakers in the world. Your car stereo has more uh, woofer, yeah. and so they're, they're mastering the records horribly. So the record might be, a uh, Beyonce record might be made great as much as I just don't like her. But maybe it's manufactured properly, and then when they get to the mastering of it, they squish it for these things it's that just... So it's mastered to sound best at the incredibly limited frequency range that MP3s give you. Right. And that's what everybody's stuck with now. And it makes Beatle records amazing, even though they were done on 4-track. Wow. You know, to my mind, it's very hard to beat 4-tracks. Oh, look at, you can't always get what you want. The, it, the Bach Symphony Choir there, right? The London Bach Choir. I don't know the London Bach Choir, but I do like the four tracks. You know what I mean. You can't always get what you want from Let It Bleed, the Rolling Stones. Yeah. yeah. And he had the choir there, the London yeah. Bach Choir. And there's that crossfade, and then the band comes in. And it sounds enormous. It sounds like it's got the 96 tracks. But it's four. Well, you know, I, th I mean, four tracks has a much more immediate and grander sound, I think. They do, because they're in your face. Yeah, they're in your face, exactly. And Frank Sinatra had to do with, with his big band, Tommy Dorsey, what he had to do with, with whatever, you know? Yeah. 
I mean, I have an amazing recording of Duke Ellington live at some Air Force base in 1943 in North Dakota made on a wire recorder. Wow. Sound is amazing. As long as they capture it, you know? Yeah. So you're a rock and roll fan. Do you get the bug to go back into a radio studio? Right. Do you do, you do radio at all still? No, no. I, I, I would love to, but I haven't in years and years. Are you working on a new book? Yeah, I'm writing a book about film directors now. I'm working on a book about film directors, a guide to film directors. Oh. Because, you know, I have two film books. I have a book called The 100 Best Films to Rent You Never Heard Of and a book about film noir called A Girl and a Gun. And I didn't want to do another biography. I don't want to put myself through all that research again. So I, I want to do a more of an aesthetic book, and that's what I'm doing now. Fascinating. Uh, we got to have you back when you, you... We do a lot of film here. We've had uh, Jody Foster on the show. Oh, good. And Robert Zemeckis. I'd love to. Uh, you know, so we'd love to... Um, and we just did a book with Richard K. I want to say Richard K. Ev Edgar's, just a couple of months ago, The 100 Best Films You've Never Seen. And your book is called The 100 Best Films? My book is called The 100 Best Films to Rent You Never Heard Of. Okay, and this fellow had a book that you've never seen. Um, well, there you go. And I think I ran across your title when I was doing research on his interview. Yeah. Uh, so we got to have you, uh, if you, if you have the time and if you had fun tonight, we got to have you back talk about the film books. Oh, I'd love it. Well, let's come back and talk movies. That'd be great. We're big on film here because uh, our show ends in about three and a half minutes. We're followed by a show called Reeling, which has got like, um, like I'm crazy. I have a, a thousand episodes now, right? They have like over 500 of reeling. So you have these crazy access producers around the world, right? right? But tomorrow night we do public domain movies here. So we usually review, like I would have had to let you sign off 10 minutes ago, but my film critic, Frank Delastrito, is in Europe with his wife. So he's out of the country. At the end of our show, we always review the public domain films, Chaplin, Hitchcock. It's a lot of fun. Oh, it's great. And uh, boy, we're on the same wavelength, David. Uh, films and... Uh, Graham Parsons and the Bee Gees. Um, is there a website for you? Yes, there's a website called If They Move, Kill Them. Really? Yes, it's a great, it's a quote from um, Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch. If They Move, Kill Them? Kill M, E M. If They Move, Kill Them. Dot com. Dot com. All right, If They Move, Kill M, E M dot com is how you can uh, look at David's work. You've got four books, or maybe more. Yeah, four books, and they're linked. To, they're linked on the website, and um, a lot, a lot of film reviews and music writing and all that sort of thing. And you're doing a conference on Sunday. Yeah, there's a Miami Book Fair is going on, and I'm going to be part of a panel at 12:30 on Sunday at the Miami Book Fair with Lynn Goldsmith and a woman who wrote a biography of The Runaways. So it should be very interesting. Oh, that'll be a lot of fun for you. Yeah, I think it'll be great. Did you see The Runaways? No, I, I never saw The Runaways. They were up here in Boston. They played The Rat. I never got to see them, but... Um, uh, you went to The Rat. You, you must have gone to The Rat. Yeah, I didn't go to The Rat that much, but I, I... You just may remember that I saw Patti Smith's first tour at Paul's Mall. Oh, yeah, I was there. And she was during an incredible blizzard. You know, it just snowed. It was like knee-deep every day that week. Oh, yeah. And she put on an amazing show. With John Cale. Yeah, I went to the Rat a couple of times and went to, you know, um, every other possible club. I was good friends with the guys um, in the Suede Cowboys. I don't know if you remember the Suede Cowboys. Of course. I used to book Cantones, and they were my number one band. Yeah. And I used to roadie, because I, I owned a truck, I used to roadie for the Suede. Brother Cleve. Brother Cleve is a very, very good friend of mine. Well, tell Brother Cleve I said hello, man. Okay, I will. Yeah. Uh, no, they were awesome. They were unbelievable. They were unbelievable. For those who don't know, I'll just say, they were the only integrated funk band in, in Boston, and they caught a ton of grief about it. You know, they got jumped by racist skinheads and beaten, and they were a great band. Now, see, I didn't know that. All I knew was that they packed Cantones, and they, their sound was velvety and wonderful. I mean, yep. not Velvet Underground, but Velvet, you know, it was smooth. Great funk band, yeah. Brother Cleve was amazing. And that's our show. We're going to be out of seconds okay. soon. Thank you so much, Joe. Anytime, let me know. Oh, we'll be in touch, man. Thank you, David. Okay. Good luck with the book, The Bee Gees. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. And that's our show. Judy Kellerman, thank you very much for uh, 
kind of directing out there. And thank you, David Meyer and Kate Kazeniak at DeCapo Press, the Bee Gees. And Reeling is on next. Reeling, we'll be back next week with Jonathan Paley of the Paley Brothers and their new record. It's amazing. Jonathan Paley, stay tuned. Reeling. <laughs>